So this week we are going to take a break from our What Do You Want series, uh, and I want to spend this Shabbat and next Shabbat uh, talking about the Passover Seder, talking about the Haggadah, uh, going through some history, and just kind of getting us situated and ready for Pesach. One of the things that I want to make sure that we do well is that we prepare for the holidays, that we prepare for the holy days, um, that we are preparing our hearts, our minds, that we are ready uh, to enjoy and learn and, and partake of all that the holiday has to teach us, uh, but also that we are also sharpening our intellect, that we know. I said a couple of weeks ago, and this has kind of been become my mantra the last, since I said it, um, is that I'm really tired of ignorant religion. I'm tired of being ignorant. I'm tired of, of people being ignorant and saying, well, they believe, well, they believe, well, they believe when they've never even talked to they. And so it's important for us as much as we want to get our hearts ready, we also want to get our minds ready. And I know that the, the Seder, it's long, there's a lot going on, the, you got to worry about your kids. You got to worry about, are we drinking wine now? Are we not? Or who's pouring? There's all these, all this theatrics that go along with it. And sometimes it can, you can kind of get lost in it. So I want to take a hopefully overview and really balanced approach to the Seder, the Haggadah, and um, just educate us a little bit. I've learned a lot just studying this the last week or so, uh, again, and uh, just kind of educate us on, on how the Haggadah and the Seder came to be. Uh, I know there are a lot of people, maybe even some folks that are listening, that just go, ah, pish posh with a Seder and a Haggadah, it's all made up by the Jews, and you know how we feel about that, um, and so we're going to tackle some of that right up front. So I'm going to make a statement that's going to aggravate some people, uh, so we're going to start off right. The Exodus story, the Exodus and its commemoration by extension is strictly a Jewish story. It is a strictly Jewish story. Now, I know already I can, I can hear the typing. But it wasn't just Jews that were in the Exodus. There was all the nation of Israel taken out of Egypt in the Exodus. Correct. And there was also a mixed multitude that was not Israelites. Correct. But I will again say that the Exodus and its commemoration is strictly Jewish. How can you say that? Well, because the only vestiges of that initial Israelite Exodus are the modern day Jewish people. Period, full stop. Yeah, but we have lost tribes. And how have they done at preserving the Passover tradition? Oh, never mind, they haven't. What we know today as the Jewish people have been the preservers of the Exodus story and its tradition. The only way we even know about an Exodus as outlined to us in the book of Shemot 11 to 18 or thereabouts is because the Jewish people have preserved the documents themselves. Well, what about the mixed multitude? Well, when, here's the thing. We, when we read the Torah, we read about the mixed multitude and we think, that's us. That's us coming out with the Jewish people. That's us that were there. We all got the Torah, and so the Torah is ours. It's for all of us. However, if you listen to some Jewish people talk about their side of the story, you know that whole golden calf thing? You know, that little issue that the Israelites had? That whole golden calf thing, guess whose fault it was? It was the mixed multitude's fault. It was what they call in Hebrew the Erev Rav. It was the mixed multitude's fault. When we hear about the complaining and the grumbling and all that stuff that is happening, it's the multitude that is causing that grumbling. 
When we hear about Israel wanting to go back to Egypt, we should have died in Egypt. It's the mixed multitude that is causing that to spread throughout the camp. So before we get too comfortable with our thinking that we were there at Mount Sinai, because we're part of the mixed multitude, before we get too comfortable, let's listen to the other side of the story and consider if there may be some validity to it. The Jewish people have retained the tradition let us also remember that we would not have a Messiah would it not be for the Jewish people. And God doesn't seem to have a problem with that. We are the ones that seem to have the problem with that. So when we even begin to approach the Torah and Passover, we have this question about all of the mitzvot, all of the Torah that we do. This should be, the, this should be kind of our checklist or I'm gonna propose kind of a three-point thing we should run through and we think about keeping any of the mitzvot we think about doing any of the Torah we have some different ways we can approach it right so one of the most popular ways we can approach the Passover and the and the Seder is we can just rip it away from the hands of the Jewish people just step on their necks and pull the tradition the Seder, the Haggadah, the Seder plate, the elements, the, we can just rip it out of their hands and we can make it what we want it to be, the right way. I'm talking to all of us Hebrew root messianic people who like to get all this messy stuff or Christians who go, well, no, the Passover was always about Jesus. Well, tell that to the people who were rescued from Egypt in the original Exodus. They didn't know a Jesus. They didn't know a Yeshua. They didn't even know really a Messiah. All they knew was Moses and the miracles that they saw from Hashem, the hand of God, from Hashem. And that's what they followed. They had no idea that 2,000 years later, some guy was going to walk around the earth that we would eventually call the Messiah. I'm sorry if that interrupts your sensibilities, but I just don't think that's how it works. So we can make it what we want to be. This is why I... I said earlier about, and I said it a couple weeks ago, about not using a messianic Haggadah. So some of you all heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again just for everybody's benefit. People ask the question every year, well, are you going to use a messianic Haggadah? And my question this year is, what makes it messianic? What makes this, the telling of the story and the Seder, what makes it messianic? Does, does Yeshua's name have to be printed on the pages? Does that make it messianic? Do we have to say a blessing about him when we say a blessing about God? Does that make it messianic? What makes it messianic? Do we have to, instead of singing the Jewish songs, which are the Psalms, do we have to sing more Christian-y songs? Does that, that mention, what makes it messianic? I thought that we all believed that the Passover was all about Yeshua anyway, right? Isn't that what we believe? Or is what we say we believe? Oh, well, what we want to do is we want to take our idea of Yeshua. We want to take our idea of this, this Western Caucasian Savior with a blonde hair and blue eyes and all the thing, the trappings that come with it, we want to take a non-denominational or a Baptist or a Catholic or a Pentecostal or whatever idea of who Yeshua is and we want to put that on the Seder and we want to form Passover in the image of our Yeshua. Well, if that's the case, then we don't really believe what we say when we say that the Passover is all about Yeshua. What we should do is let the Passover, the Seder, and the traditions of the people who have preserved this for us teach us, and you know what it might actually do? It might actually point out some areas where your version of Yeshua is not quite right. <gasps> Gasp. It might actually give you some room to question how you see Yeshua and his role and all of this cosmic role. It may actually challenge the traditional understandings of what is salvation? What is the exodus? What is deliverance? What is Mashiach? 
but we don't want to be brave enough to answer those questions or ask those questions. We want to form the Seder and the Haggadah to the detriment of the people who have carried it and preserved it to our own image. So that's one way we can approach it. I would request respectfully that we don't do that. Number two, we can pretend that we are Jewish. You know, ish. Jewish. And that we, we have all the things, we have the plates, we have the da-da-da, we have all the things, and that we, this was us. We were there. Now, there is a component to the Seder where, where they, the stages say that everyone should, uh, should partake of the Seder as if they were rescued from <coughs> Egypt personally. Excuse me. But whenever we, we pretend that we're Jewish or probably not Jewish, but we're one of the lost tribes, that might hit a little closer to home for some folks, maybe some of you watching. But then we make it all about us and we forget that the Seder, like in most things Torah related, is incredibly cultural. It is incredibly cultural. I'm not real big on, you know, progressive ideas and progressive thoughts, but cultural appropriation is a thing. That doesn't mean that you can't go out and have a taco, you know, um, on Taco Tuesday. What? You're not culture appropriating. But whenever we take the Seder and we, we pretend like it's ours and we use it for our purposes and we make it about us and we forget the original audience, then we are taking something that doesn't belong to us and we're making it about us. The third way we can approach this is to understand that we may not have come out in the original Exodus. We may not be able to trace, I may not be able to trace my bloodline to someone who came out in the original Exodus. But what I can do is trace my life and my experience to a time when I bowed my head and closed my eyes and I invited the Messiah, the Savior of the world to become the ruler of my life. And I believe at that moment, he drew me close to the God of the covenant, the God who did bring a nation out of Israel. And me, a person who was a goy, one from the nations, one that was not in the covenant of Israel, I, through no merit of my own, got to be drawn close and drawn into the family, the covenant, the kingdom of Hashem, with no doing. I didn't have to be born into it. I didn't have to do anything. God reached out to me in his mercy and his grace, and he saved me from my idolatry and from my sin and from my bondage, and he allowed me adoption into the family of God. So, I don't have to be one that came out in the, in the Exodus. I don't have to be of Jewish lineage. But what I have to do, we have to do, is we have to humbly respect those that have preserved the story, those that have taken on the, the yoke of the commandment to teach their children from generation to generation, we have to respect and humbly let the traditions preserved for us and let them teach us about our own salvation, our own redemption, our own deliverance, and let them teach us about our responsibility as a part of the family. So, we have the Haggadah. First of all, what does the word Haggadah mean? Or Haggadah, you can say it both ways. There's a, some several opinions on what the word actually means. Um, but very simply, we have the Hebrew word agada. In, in, in Jewish writing, in Jewish thought, there are two really big spheres of, of writing and of thought. There is halakha, which is the practical, mechanical, what you do, the walking out of the Torah. And there is Agada. 
Agadah is the storytelling, the narrative, the how you pass on, how you pass on uh, ethics and, 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 you know, and, and treasures of morality and how you teach lessons from generation to generation. Those are told in stories called Agadah. So there is a command that we're going to read. You, if you want to go ahead and get ahead of me a little bit, you can turn to Exodus chapter 12 and just kind of get ready because we're going to read that whole chapter pretty much. There's a command in Exodus in Shemot chapter 12 that fathers tell their children, teach their children, and pass on the story of the Exodus from generation to generation. So the word Haggadah, Ha-Agadah, shortened to Haggadah, just means the telling, okay? So that's what this book is, okay? It is the telling. This book is the modern day fulfilling of the commandment to teach the story to our children okay that's what the Haggadah is so while you're turning there I just want to share some things that I, I, I found the last few years and I think they're really interesting so there are um, there are more versions of the of the Haggadah than any other Jewish writing that we know of what do you mean more versions well I looked up some, and I think you'll find this interesting. You might find it a little bit of, a little bit off-putting, but uh, either way, um, so we have this. Uh, we have the Chabad organization, which many of you are familiar with. Um, they have what what is generally agreed as the most user-friendly Haggadah. So if you're brand new, you don't know which way in is up. Chabad is a great place to go for the best user-friendly one. There's also a social justice Haggadah. Now, I know that some of you that listen to the news a lot and stuff are going to be like, oh. But when we talk about social justice Haggadah, we're talking about an emphasis on those in captivity, those that are discriminated against, those that are used and manipulated and oppressed, right? Which is not a bad thing. You could say that is the Exodus story. Um, many of you might not know that we don't drink Maxwell House around here because community um but there is a maxwell house haggadah did you know about this in 1923 in a like a marketing stunt maxwell house did like a buy one get one where they you bought some of their coffee you got a haggadah right kind of crazy um recently some of you ladies will be interested in this because we've talked about this before recently maxwell house uh partnered with amazon and they created a marvelous Miss Maisel Haggadah. So you might want to find, I knew Robin would get a kick out of that. <laughs> there, look, she's on it already. There are kid-friendly Haggadahs. So if you have a bunch of little ones, you know, we, we do, we have our community Seder and then in the diaspora, you, you option to do a second night of the Seder. Um, and if you want to do one at home, you don't have to do exactly what we did here on the first night. If you have kids, there's a kid-friendly Haggadah that's a little bit shorter. It's illustrated. It's more, you know, activity for the kids. You could do that on the second night. Um, there is uh, the Haggadah for short seders. If you're just not in a three-hour seder, then there are Haggadot that are specifically for you, Brady. Um, there are... <laughs> There is a, there's a Haggadah. Were you raising your hand or scratching your head? I took it as raising your hand. So um, there are Haggadahs that are graphic novels. So it's almost laid out kind of like a comic book kind of sort of thing, which is really cool. Um, and then there are pop culture Haggadahs. And these are the ones that I think are, are really interesting. I want to do some, some looking up. So um, we have uh, the unofficial Hogwarts Haggadah. Now, some of you don't even know what that is. Uh, that is, um, I just went blank. Harry Potter. Harry Potter, thank you, thank you. Um, so created in 2017. Uh, there is, uh, if you're a fan of uh, zombie stuff, there is a zombie Haggadah. Um, there is a Hamilton Haggadah. You know the Broadway show, Hamilton? Uh, there's a Hamilton Haggadah. Um, we talked about the Miss Mage. Uh, there's a Yada Yada Haggadah. Anybody know that reference? From where? Yada, yada, yada. What sitcom was that from? Seinfeld. So there's a yada, yada Haggadah. Um, I don't know how popular this show is amongst our group, but Curb Your Haggadah. There's a show called Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, there's an emoji Haggadah, where all through the Haggadah, there are emojis that show up. 
there is a superhero Haggadah for uh, you know the Marvel fans, um, and then there is a baseball Haggadah, a festival of freedom and springtime in 15 innings, uh, because there are 15 parts to the Haggadah. So that's just a little small snapshot. There are uh, there's a Haggadah for everyone, and one of the themes that we're going to see between this week and next week is that this telling of the story is malleable it's it's meant to be worked and to be attributed and and used for our season and our time and our generation i can guarantee you this that in the land of israel specifically that those families that are sitting around the seder table this pesach especially those who have loved ones who are still in captivity but those that have been affected by this war and have friends and loved ones that have hostages still by Hamas, I bet you their Haggadah, their Seder is gonna look a lot different than it has in years past. Because the story of the Exodus has taken on a new meaning so it needs to be told and discussed in a different way. Does that make sense? So Exodus chapter 12, Shemot chapter 12, Now Adonai spoke to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, Mitzrayim, and he said, this month will mark the beginning of months for you. It is to be a month of the year, a first month of the year for you, all of the congregation of Israel, that on the 10th day of this month, each man shall take a lamb for his family and one for his household. Now, I want to point this out because we don't necessarily read it this way, but I want you to notice in verse Three, it says, tell all the who? Congregation of Kalal Israel. It doesn't say tell the mixed multitude. You ever noticed that before? I'm not trying to take it away from anybody. I'm just trying to say there is a distinction that we need to pick up on. Each man has to take a lamb for his family, one lamb for the household. But if the, lamb is too, uh, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor are to take one according to the number of people. According to each person eating, you are to make count for the lamb. Your lamb is to be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So somebody that has listened to Joe and Rico's talk about para oduma, how old is one year old lamb? at least eight days right at eight days an animal becomes one year old all the way until a year and eight days because at a year and nine days it is then two years old okay so you must verse six watch over it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to slaughter it at twilight they are to take the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the crossbeam of the houses where they will eat. They are to eat that night, roasted over fire with matzah and bitter herbs. They are to eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but only roasted with fire, its head and legs and innards. Let nothing of it remain until morning. Whatever remains until the morning, you shall burn with fire. You are to eat it in this way. Your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in haste. It is Adonai's Passover. So let's just stop there. I'm going to make a couple comments. So first of all, as far as elements go for this Passover meal, first of all, Passover is a meal. Passover is not a day. Passover is not a, a, a time that sunset to sunset or anything like that. Passover is a meal, okay? It's very important to remember that the importance of the Passover is in the meal. It's in the eating. We have some elements that are mentioned here. Lamb, bitter herbs, and matzah, right? Unleavened bread. That is, that is the original elements of the Passover. And when we talk about... Um, the, the bitter herbs, we're talking about things like uh, anything from uh, horseradish to lettuce to chicory. There's different, there are, the Mishnah actually, um, we don't really know what bitter herbs are in the Passover tradition until we get to the Mishnah, which is 
like 200 AD. And we find out that they, they talk about five different types of bitter herbs um, that are allowable or that are recommended for Pesach. So you only have three elements. So if you want to keep a quote-unquote biblical Passover, then you roast a lamb. But we'll get to that in a second. And then you have some kind of bitter herbs. And then you have matzah. And you have done a biblical Passover. Oh, but wait. But you also have to wear a, a robe. And you have to have a, sta a staff. And you have to have shoes on your feet. Well, that's ridiculous. No, no, no. If we're going to be belligerent about doing a biblical Passover and doing it the way Exodus 12 says to do it, then uh, you better put your cloak on and have your staff in your hand. Oh, and you have to put, um, you have to put blood on your doorpost. Of course, I'm being facetious, but there are people that actually do it this way. What they have not done is read on in the Torah where God says in Deuteronomy, from now on, you don't make a sacrifice anywhere except the place where I, I place my name forever. And that is Jerusalem in a standing temple with a kosher altar. If you are not in Jerusalem in the temple with a kosher altar, you don't sacrifice a lamb. I don't care how backwoods Arkansas you are. It doesn't matter. You don't do it because you cannot try to keep the commandments by breaking a commandment you cannot keep the Torah by breaking the Torah and the Torah like it or not evolves as the nation moves there are times when God says we're going to set up the tabernacle here you can have high places <gasps> what yes God allowed Bamot high places but you get to Shiloh and God says, no high places, only here. Then you go from Shiloh further into the land, you can have high places again. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to know? Well, thankfully, we don't have to worry about it. Where was I? Oh, yeah. You can't slaughter a lamb. Now, this is why there is a prohibition in Judaism for even eating lamb are specifically eating roasted lamb because we don't they want to be very careful that nobody thinks that you're actually performing the Passover sacrifice because that would be breaking the Torah so and those people are not just in Arkansas by the way they're all over the place but the ones personally I know of are in Arkansas um, so we don't have a big Arkansas viewership, so I'm not really worried about it. Um, we don't now. No, we don't. Yeah, we don't now. Um, less than we less than we did. Just change the channel. It's okay. Um, yeah, they don't do it anyway. They're fine. So we have some elements, uh, and so that's a basic a basic Pesach, right? And so we get down, and it says that we are. Uh, to roast it that night, uh, do not eat any of it. Let it uh, let it boil tomorrow. Okay, so verse ten. So let none of it remain till morning. Whatever remains in the morning, you are to burn with fire. Also, you are to eat it this way with your loins gird, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste, for it is Adonai's Passover. Verse twelve. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and strike down every firstborn, men and animals, and I will execute judgments against the gods of Egypt. I am Adonai. The blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are. Okay, verse 14. This is, a this is to be a memorial for you. You are to keep it as a feast to Adonai. Throughout your generations, you are to keep it as an eternal ordinance. Okay, and then we go into the uh, instructions for Hag Hamatzo. So, just real quick. The, again, the Passover Seder is done in the evening. That is the meal. That is the Passover. And when the sun sets as we're eating that meal or before we've eaten that meal, as the sun sets, that begins the first day of Hag Hamatzah, okay? Begins the first day of unleavened bread, which is a Yom Tov. Let's go down. Um, let's go down to verse 26. Uh, I'm sorry, 25. When you come into the land which Adonai will give you, as he promised, you are to keep this ceremony. Now, when it happens that your children, by the way, that phrase, that pesky phrase, when you come into the land, pops up here. So there can be some argument that maybe that Passover shouldn't even be done outside of the land of Israel. Uh, 
Uh, you are to keep this at verse 26. Now, when it happens that your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You are to say, it is the sacrifice of Adonai's Passover because he passed over the houses of B'nai Israel in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians, but spared our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. And then it goes on to tell the rest of the story of the Pesach. So when we talk about how do we keep Passover, what are we to do um, with Passover? You have the option of just going with Exodus 12. And go, we're going to eat some lamb. I mean, I don't, I mean, you can eat lamb for Passover. Just don't go through the act of like you're sacrificing it. That's a no-no. But if you, if you buy lamb somewhere, you have a lamb and you butcher one, whatever, that's cool. Um, have lamb, bitter herbs, Passover. Read the story. Tell it to your kids. Talk about it. That could be your Passover Seder. That, that could perfectly be it, okay? But we have some uh, evolutions of it. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 35. And we're not going to read a whole, whole lot here, uh, but I want to jump ahead, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 35, and this is the time of Josiah, so this is post-exile, right? Second Chronicles chapter 35, and we're going to just going to start in the first verse, and then we'll skip uh, down a few verses, or read down a few verses, excuse me. 2 Chronicles 35, it says, So Josiah celebrated Passover unto Adonai in Jerusalem. They slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the first month. He reinstated the Kohanim to their duties and encouraged them in the service of the house of Adonai. He said to the Levites who taught all Israel and who were consecrated to Adonai, Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of King David of Israel, built. That's the temple. Since it is no longer a burden on your shoulders now, serve Adonai your God and his people Israel prepare yourselves by your ancestral houses in your divisions according to the writings of King David of Israel and according to the writing of his son Solomon stand in the holy place by the divisions of the ancestral houses by sons of the people and their divisions of ancestral houses of the Levites now sanctify yourselves slaughter the Passover lamb and prepare it for your kinsmen according to the word of Adonai by the hand of Moses Josiah provided all for all the people who were present, flocks of lambs and goats, totaling 30,000. For all the Passover offerings, as well as 3,000 bulls, all from the king's possessions. His officials also gave a free will offering to the people, the Kohanim and the Levites. Man, there's a, there's a twist for you. The rich people actually give the poor people offerings instead of it being the other way around. Imagine that. Um, they, uh, Hilkiah, Zechariah, and uh, Yehiel, the administrators of the house of God, donated to the Kohanim 2,600 Passover offerings and 300 bulls. And so this is post-exile. And what we know about uh, the, the Passover in this time of the Judean kings is that uh, they used the Passover as as a, a coming together of the nation. So it became more of a national thing. They are post-exile, so they're trying to rebuild the nation. And Passover is, is not so much focused on the retelling of the Exodus. It's about, what did you hear about? The lambs, right? Kill the Passover lamb, kill the Passover lamb, kill the Passover lamb. That's several times in this passage. So that's post-exile. That's 600-ish BC. Let's go to... Um, let's go move forward a little bit to the second century BCE. So this is uh, just, you know, a couple hundred years. This is between the Maccabees and Yeshua to kind of situate us in time. Um, and we're going to read from the book of Jubilees. I don't think I've ever read from the book of Jubilees on a Shabbat since the inception of OAM, but this is fun. So let's do it. This is from the book of Jubilees, chapter 49, verses 1 through 3 or 5 ish. Um, you can go back and read this online later. Uh, it says, Remember the commandment which the Lord commanded you concerning Passover, that you observe it in its time on the 14th of the first month, so that you might sacrifice it before it becomes evening, so that you might eat it during the night on the evening of the 15th from the time of sunset. For on this night there was the beginning of the feast, and there was the beginning of joy. You continued eating the Passover in Egypt. And all the powers of Mastema, which is like a word for a Satan or adversary, were sent to kill off the firstborn of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the captive maidservant who was at the millstone and to the cattle. And this is the sign which Adonai gave to the powers of Mastema 
in every house where they saw the blood of a year old lamb upon its door so they would not enter in the house so they kill they would pass over so that all who were in the house might be saved because the sign of the blood was on its doors and it continues to go on and all of Israel remained eating the flesh of the Passover and drinking wine and blessing and glorifying the Lord the God of their fathers so I want you to see already between Josiah and this, uh, this account, 2nd century BCE account in, uh, in, in the book of Jubilees, you have a, a, very, uh, a very particular concentration on what Passover is about. It is about eating the lamb, having the lamb. It is about praising and glorifying God. That is, those are the main components. You notice in here, there's nothing about bitter herbs. There's nothing about salt water. There's nothing about, it, there's nothing about any of this stuff, right? Let's go on. Now let's go to the first century AD. Uh, first century AD. Uh, this is from Philo of Alexandria. So Philo uh, was a Jew living in Alexandria who was a philosopher and historian and wrote prolifically. Uh, this is what he says. This is, again, first century AD. He says, and after the feast of the new moon comes the fourth festival, that of the Passover, which the Hebrews call Pascha, on which the whole people offer sacrifice, beginning at noonday and continuing until evening. And what was done, the law enjoined to be repeated once every year as a memorial of the gratitude due for their deliverance. For those who are to share in the feast come together, not as they do to other entertainments, to gratify their bellies with wine and meat, but put to fulfill their hereditary custom with prayer and songs of praise. And this universal sacrifice of the whole people is celebrated on the 14th day of the month. Another first century reference we have also Josephus. He says, in the month of Xanticus, which is, no, which is called by us Nisan, and is the beginning of our year, on the 14th day of the lunar month, which the sun is in Aries, uh, and the law ordained that we should every year slay that sacrifice which I before told you that we slew when we came out of Egypt, and which was called the Passover. And so we do celebrate the Passover in companies, leaving nothing of what we sacrifice till the day following so what i want you to see in these different uh, accounts of keeping the passover is that we have the passover in exodus and we have that story and those commands and how you keep the passover and then you can see as time goes on that the focus of the passover begins to change just a little bit it evolves from time to time and as the actions and the history of Israel change, things affect how Israel reads the Passover. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And hopefully now with some of that context, as you read Matthew chapter 26, we'll hear some familiar things that give you a context verse 26 says now while they were eating Yeshua took matzah and after he offered the bracha he broke and gave the disciples and said take eat this is my body and he took a cup and after giving thanks he gave them saying drink from it all of you and this is probably not a big deal but something that I noticed this week while I was studying we call Yeshua the Passover lamb right where do we get that from? <laughs> it calls in the back. First Corinthians, written by, written by, Paul, Paul probably, um, from First Corinthians. And here's where, again, might not be a big deal, but just something that was tickling my brain as I was trying to go to sleep the last couple nights. This is evidence, further evidence of our. Pauline Christianity Paul calls Yeshua our Passover not lamb our Passover by the way but Yeshua doesn't call himself the lamb here he calls himself the matzah 
take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, right? He says, he takes the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink it, all of you, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the removal of sins. But I say to you, I will never drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until the day I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. And verse 30, after singing the Hallel, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So, what we have in context is we have a meal, right? Now, the lamb is not mentioned here, but we have the meal, we have this eating and drinking, the wine, and then we have the singing of psalms or praising God. This is what we see begin to happen all the way from the time of uh, Jubilees. It's about eating and it's about offering praises to God. Now, the praises that we have here is the Hallel Psalms, which is a section of the psalms that we will read um, uh, beginning in Psalm 115, is it? 115 to 18? No, 13 to 18. Um, that we will read during the Passover Seder. And it is songs of praise. So, we go from Matthew, and we figure, you know, Yeshua's crucified, 30 ish, rises, is resurrected, ascends. And so from 30 to for the next few years, if you're a family that is celebrating Passover in the land of Israel and or surrounding areas, you're going to choose a lamb. You're going to go up to Jerusalem if you're close enough. If you're not close enough, then you are going to trade your, your flocks or your crops for silver, and you are going to take that in your little money pouch, and you're going to go up to Jerusalem. You're going to purchase a lamb, and the Passover lambs were all bred in where? Bethlehem, right. Um, you're going to purchase a lamb that has been taken care of and bred specifically for Pesach. You're going to purchase a lamb. You are going to bring it up to the temple where a Levite is going to slaughter it. They're going to take some of the blood. They're going to splash it on the altar, which is full of blood, because there were, Josephus tells us there was something like two million people in Jerusalem at certain times for the Passover during certain years. So you can imagine the amount of lambs, the amount of slaughtering, right? This is an all-day process. And then the Levites are going to butcher that lamb, and they are going to give you a portion back, and you're going to take that home, and you're going to roast it, and then you're going to eat it that night with your family as you tell the Passover story, Right? But something cataclysmic happens that changes the way that Judaism sees Passover forever. What is that event? The destruction of the temple in 70 AD. As a response to Jewish rebellion, the Romans come in and finally say, enough, they destroy the temple. Now, if you are a, 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 an Israelite, your life revolves even if you live on the outskirts of Jerusalem, your life revolves around the temple permeates all of Jewish life. Even if you're way up in the Galilee or way down in the Gev, the temple permeates how you do life. It's central to your way of life. So with its destruction, the Jewish people had to, the, the sages of the time had to figure out what do we do? The Paschal lamb is the center of Passover. It is the whole point. It is what all of Passover revolves around. What do we do now that we cannot make the offering? So as I've told you before, then the altar of Beit HaMikdash, the Mizbeach, is transferred to the family table. And the, the temple becomes the home, becomes the family, becomes the people. And so we have a transition of the Jewish people from being really temple service focused to be more text focused from temple to text Rabbi Sachs calls it where in one in one year in in 69 of the common era they're doing the services they're flocking to Jerusalem. The Levites are on the Dukan, their platform, and they're singing praises. And the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the Kohanim are offering and doing all the things. And then the temple is destroyed. Now what do you do? 
You go from service, from temple, to text. You keep this tradition alive through the text. And so we have two writings, the Mishnah and the Tosefta. Again, we've talked about these things. There was uh, uh, a rabbi who had two students, and that rabbi's name was, who remembers? Come on, from our, oh, it's been like a year, man. You guys have all forgotten, right? So we have Rabbi Akiva, who started to collect the sayings of the sages. Remember, all this stuff was oral. None of this stuff was written down. But Rabbi Akiva started to collect these, these traditions and these say, sayings from all of these different parts of Israel, and he began to write them down. You're talking about second century. He gave, when he passed, his students, two of his students took on that job. One of the students went on to compile what we call the Mishnah. The other student went on to compile the Tosefta. So the Mishnah is the most basic skeleton, bare bones writing of Jewish law. And it's still like six volumes. It's massive. Well, it's six divisions. It's many more volumes. The Tosefta has a little bit of commentary and explanation with it. So they're the same work, just one is stripped down and one is a little more explanatory. And in each of those writings, in the section Pesachim, you can go on Sepharia and you can read this if you'd like. In uh, Mishnah Pesachim chapter 10 and in Tosefta Pesachim chapter 10, we have a, the proto-Seder that is being described. And it talks about wine and it talks about singing psalms. And there's a whole debate about who can offer and who can. And what about if somebody is unclean and what if they're not. And there's all these knots that they tie themselves up right about, about doing the Passover. It's fantastic. Um, they talk about what how many times you wash hands and what blessings you say or don't say a blessing and do this if you want to be really nerdy about Passover go check out those two uh, uh, those two uh, uh, Mishnah and Tosefta and there's one thing that arises one really major component for our purposes for the Haggadah that arises out of all that discussion okay it is that the rabbis come to a consensus that as part of the telling of the Passover, we must focus on how bad we were enslaved. We must focus on our slavery, on our defamation as a people, on our degradation as humans. That must be the focus, one of the focuses of the Seder. So they... they kind of uh, 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 excuse me I can't think of the word I'm trying to say they kind of uh, uh, landed on Deuteronomy 26 which is normally read at Shavuot but it says a wandering Ar Armenian tried to kill my father not was my father tried to kill my father right you know that passage we read that in the Seder now they, they chose that verse that passage because it reflects the beginning of the story that would eventually end up in Egypt, right? Who was the wandering Armenian? Arme Armenian, whatever I say, right? It was Laban, right? Laban tries to kill Jacob, which sets off this whole series of events that ends the nation of Israel in Egypt, the famine, etc., etc. And so we begin the story there as those cards begin to fall. But even in the time of the mission of the Tosefta, so you're talking about 200 AD, 300 AD, there's still no Haggadah. It doesn't exist, even after the destruction of the temple. Fast forward, and we're wrapping up. Fast forward to the 10th century. The oldest Haggadah that has ever been found is from the late 9th, early 10th century, or if I have that backwards. Um, and it was found in a what's called a Geneza. Now, those of you who have been on our temple study on Wednesday nights, you should know what a Geneza is, but I'll just remind you. I'll say it. You don't have to. Um, a Geneza is, uh, is a place where the Jewish people bury sacred texts. So if to preserve them, because the text, either they have the name of God on them or the Tetragrammaton, or they bury them. 
or they, they lock them away and uh, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls is a good uh, example of a Geneza, right? It was in a cave locked away in pots. This, this is the way that you treat holy texts. You put them away, you bury them in a, in a, a structure called a Geneza. And there's a Geneza found in Cairo, Egypt that has a Haggadah from the 9th, 10th century from that time frame in there. And so we found, we find one in, in, uh, in uh, Cairo. We found, they, we found, I didn't find anything. They found uh, some in Israel and they found some in Babylonia. And we know that the Haggadah is not a separate thing even at that point, 10th century. It's not a separate thing. It's found in a part of other liturgies as like, this is how we do stuff, right? And this is how we do the Passover. And even the rabbis in the 10th century were very reluctant to tell people how to do the Passover. They didn't want to exert a lot of control over it. They wanted people to be able to express the Passover in a way that was important for them. So that's the 10th century. All of that changed in 1440. What happened in 1440? Something really cataclysmic, not cataclysmic, something earth changing happened in 1440 the printing press was invented the printing press changed all this because now when a rabbi would print out a Haggadah it became the right one and nobody's should be doing anything differently than the way his was done and he could print copies and if you could afford to print the copies then guess whose Haggadah took preeminence the one who had the money to print most copies and put it in the hands of the people. There became a strict adherence to Haggadah. And then I want to read to finish up from the intro to uh, the family Haggadah that we're using. By the way, uh, I encourage you guys, and I want to still do, you've got a week, a little over a week left. I would encourage you to go through, read the introduction, go through the Seder, read all the parts so that you, are, you know what, what's happening. Um, I found this is really, really, really cool. So it says, the Talmud lays down the dictum that our narrative of freedom must begin with the tale of our degradation. For it is only when someone recalls how bad things were that he can realize how good things are. The Haggadah's narrative of the torturous slavery of Egypt is understandable. That was bondage in its most literal sense. Surely freedom must have been sweet to the Jew whose back still marred from the scars of the taskmaster's whip to the mother whose child had been bricked into a pyramid or drowned in the Nile. But the Haggadah contains a second narrative of degradation and our escape from it. Originally, our ancestors were idol worshipers. But now the omnipresent has brought us near to his service. Who of Israel's ancestors were idol worshipers? Somebody give me the answer. Come on, come on. Who was Abraham's father? Terach, right? Terach was the idol worshiper. He was a priest of Nimrod. So it says there is another slavery, another degradation, one that is not to masters holding whips, enforcing production quotas murdering children separating families idolatry too is a form of enslavement for when the people choose idols that suit their own desires and concerns they are truly slaves to their own passions our ancestors were pagans as pagans they were spiritually flawed and they could have and they would not have passed on their spiritual blemish Oh, sorry, they would have passed on their spiritual blemish to their posterity had not Israel been liberated from its slavery to codes of man's own creation. So the Exodus represented a twofold liberation from physical enslavement to spiritual uh, and from spiritual degradation. The nation as a whole was cleansed from both blemishes. On the night of Passover, it came to acknowledge no master but God. And it began the trek to the wilderness where it would stand at Sinai and declare its, wilderness, its willingness to accept the privilege of bearing God's message of truth and morality. As I said in the beginning, you and I may not be able to 
connect with an Exodus story where we were rescued from slavery. I don't know anybody in this room, Baruch Hashem, that has ever been a slave to another human being. I may not know your full story, but I don't know anyone who has that experience. And just like we have never been exiled, we don't know how to really connect with a story that is about physical enslavement. However, long before you and I started keeping the Passover, the Jewish people in the Haggadah realized that to truly tell the story of freedom, you have to tell the story of enslavement. And for those Jews who came along centuries after the original Exodus, who hadn't been enslaved by another human being, they found profound and deep meaning in looking back to idolatry and God rescuing with the call of Abraham from idolatry. And what I want to submit is that this is already in the mind of the writers of the New Testament. As they talk about Yeshua being our Pesach, he is our deliverance, not from a physical bondage, not from whips of taskmasters and physical chains. He is our Pesach from what? From idolatry, from the paganness, from the, as it says in the, uh, the Haggadah so, uh, in, in the introduction so beautifully, from the stain of idolatry that we would have passed on to the next generation had it not been for the merciful uh, show of grace that God gave to us when he called us out of that life and rescued. So, this can be your Passover. It can be my Passover. On that first night, we will do it together. We will use this Haggadah. We will go through the Haggadah and we will go through all 15 steps and we will read it together and we'll eat and we'll have a wonderful time. But I want to encourage you on the second night to have a Seder that fits your family, that fits what you've been through, fits what you've come out of. It reflects the, thanks, the thanksgiving and the gratefulness that you have for what Hashem has done in your life. And you know what? Make it as messianic as you want. <laughs> Do it however you would like. The point of this is that the Haggadah is made to be malleable and moldable throughout the generations. As I said, the Seders in Israel this year are gonna look a lot different than they ever have been before. Because in every generation there is a Pharaoh, not only to the land and people of Israel, but in every generation, in our generations, in seasons of your life, there is a Pharaoh that has tried to kill you. We can call him Satan. We can call it life. We can call it a person that has abused and maybe has tried to steal your joy and steal your life. We can call it a lot of different things. The truth of the matter is that we have a lot of rescuings to be thankful about this year. We have a lot of deliverances to be thankful for. And so we need to come into Passover, into the Seder, into the Haggadah with those things in mind, that we have our own thankfulness that we need to show. Amen? Next week, uh, we're gonna finish up a few things that I wanna talk about the Haggadah, and then we're gonna go through all of the steps uh, and explain things a little bit just talk so that everybody's ready because here's the thing I don't want to do this Seder this year like we've done it other years where we have to stop and explain and it takes like four hours I don't want to do that but I also don't want you to go through the Seder and finish and go well I don't even know what I learned I want you to be prepared ahead of time right because we don't want to be ignorant about what we're doing right amen